Hey everybody, welcome to this lecture on Bob Arneson's artwork, a uh, subject that is near and dear to my heart. Um, Bob lived a relatively short life. He only lived to be 62. And um, he was a local artist right here from the Bay Area. And even really close to us here at DBC, he was born and raised in Benicia and and passed away in Benicia. He went to the College of Marin right across the Richmond Bridge. He attended the California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland and also Mills College in Oakland. Um, and his artwork it was just um, a broad spectrum, but very much riveted to the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, um, here in California particularly. Um, his graduating show at Mills, oddly enough, even though he is known for his sculpture, was all pottery, and he was quite a, a student of Tony Prieto at um, Arts and Crafts. His teaching stints, you know, after he finished school, were that he was kind of an average Joe. He was a he was a high school teacher. Uh, he taught junior college at Santa Rosa Junior College. He was a Mills College. Uh, adjunct uh, before he finally landed a full-time job at UC Davis and where he stayed 29 years and that's where he really settled in and his career launched from there um, which was that he has become known as one of the founders of the Northern California funk art especially as it relates to clay um, not you know it's pretty profound uh, pretty profound shoes that he uh, has left for us to follow with. Anyways, how his career started, I talked to you about some of his influences, but um, he gravitated, uh, he, he had a lot of heroes and vocals was one of them in the abstract expression, saw the rest of them that we spoke about, but he gravitated strongly to the ideals of pop art and specifically pointing out the angles um, of cultural manipulation, how we are manipulated by culture, Even as simple things as advertisements. And um, he grabbed onto icons just much as uh, Andy Warhol had um, that, you know, are signals or kind of like talisman of how we're harnessed by our own consumption. <laughs> They're sort of symbols of our own consumption and define our rewards. He made a bunch of trophies, had a whole series of trophies. He made that of dubious kind of like, oh, <laughs> awards for them, some downright obscene. <laughs> um, he was not a stranger to shocking people. He also made work about the stereotypical and the mundane, especially as it relates to ceramics. So he he made things that, well, clay's only good for clay pots or for, you know, toilets or things like that. But he also, um, almost everything he made, if it was common objects, there was an edge to it. Like these call girls, they're a little bit body, right? Or um, a simple toaster, right? Or a typewriter, things that are everyday kind of objects, or toilets, but always with the subtext. And that's really important to remember about Bob. Um, <laughs> if there wasn't a subtext, I don't think we'd be talking about it. If there wasn't, I always think of it him this way is that when I looked at his work from a distance, it was interesting or it was weird or it was whatever. Um, but when I got closer and when I still am able to see it and get closer, there was always something more to learn. There was something secret that you had to figure out. Like here with the uh, toasters, references to the persistent you know, sort of political structure that continues to promote Holocaust in around the world. But I mean, just a simple toaster and he was poking into different whole areas of subject matter or the subject of the typewriter being the inequity that's perpetuated through notions of well that's women's work and things like that of course the fingers with finger nail polish on them or questions of true value and most what's the most recently claimed and acclaimed creative genius by the artwork or, or any other authority. So these kind of things, he had ideas about them and not a lot of respect. <laughs> so with that said, he was a rabble rouser, there's no doubt. So when asked to participate in a prestigious national exhibition, um, 
for one of the first times in his career, he submitted toilets, and they were these, you know, narrative storytelling toilets, and <laughs> true to his form of the way he worked. And the New York critics labeled him, this is the first time he was on a kind of national you know, stage, a typically vacuous California artist. Game on, Bob sprang into action, and he kind of went De Niro, you know, I mean, you know, in an artistic sense. So you really want to see a vacuous California artist, huh? All right, let me show you. So, um... <laughs> I got your vacuous California artist right here. And say hello to my little friend. <laughs> so he could be downright irreverent. So um, works like this really started to get Bob attention. Uh, and his fire was lit, just to say the least. And he started to re reference other works that he had just started almost by accident. And he started to do self-portraits, a lot of them using himself as every man, so to speak, every person, so to speak. Um, like this one, which was called Portrait of an Artist Losing Its Marbles. Or he explored psychology and as, as well as avoidance. You know, you can see here that, you know, Bob's happy, and all these little Bobs are talking, but Bob has earplugs in, so he's not listening, even to himself. But Bob, basically, at this time, he was constructing his own persona and his own career, as seen here by a man, you know, making an image of himself, constructing himself. And like this also, like the human cre humanistic, humanistic credo of humanism, um, man is the measure of all things. In other words, great faith in humanity. Well, Bob became the measure of all things Bob. <laughs> uh, with a healthy dose of irony, always with a healthy dose of irony and self-deprecation. Bob was the master chef. Bob was the brain. Bob was the balancing act. More than once, you know, Bob was a clown. Bob was unsophisticated. Yes, he could do that really well. Bob was considered a narcissist. Uh, and, and a kook. I wrote cook, but I meant kook. <laughs> Sorry about that typo. He might have been a cook too, but he was also a kook. Uh, and Bob made lots of messes. You know, he, you know, in his artwork, he was always stirring up the pot, so to speak. He was also a cool hombre. Yep, Bob could be cool, and he liked to think think of himself as cool. And he also could be a self snuggler. <laughs> He could also be boisterous and obnoxious and dense, um, as his students, many of whom I've had, will tell you. He was a tongue waggler, and uh, and he could be indulgent and self-aggrandizing, and so many faces of Bob. But that is the point. He used himself as a model for the multiplicity of any any subject, and he was using himself as every person, so to speak, and where nothing was sacred. He didn't want to show just the good. He wanted to show everything. He also explored his heroes' personas, not only himself, but, the, you know, he went through people that he admired, like Van Gogh, Marcel Duchamp, Pablo Picasso, Bella Fry, Peter Volkus, Jackson Pollock, all these people who were his heroes, even pop artists like Elvis Presley, and so many others. That's just a a taste, uh, but he would do the same thing with them and show them from multiple sides. Even if he really liked and admired them, you would see all their quirks, you would see all their edges, um, all their idiosyncratic uh, nonsense, so to speak, along with their genius, and that was kind of what he was about. He also had a lot of other, you know, subject matters, like, you know, the dubious relationship between money and art, which he was always kind of annoyed with. Um, but all that aside, in short, Arneson's uh, explored everything from multiple angles. That was his shtick. That was how he worked. Um, uh, his notions of honest work, I, re I truly believe, from everything I've read and everything I've seen, um, was to incorporate every potential perspective of an art subject matter, whatever the subject matter. His idea was that you didn't romanticize, you didn't aggrandize, you didn't, you know, uh, propagandize so much as you tried to show every angle and let the viewer make up their own mind kind of deal. In order to coax all this, you know, towards the end that in order to coax some sort of truth out of what he was doing. 
So basically, his 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 posture to making art making was uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly were all fair game. So uh, his career was going along. He had a good job. He's cruising, and you know, a few people knew who he was. But then this thing happened, and he was given a commission to do a portrait of uh, Mayor Moscone. And so when it came to commemorate, commemorating the fallen uh, mayor who was murdered together with super, uh, city supervisor Harvey Milk, you might remember from the movie Harvey Milk with Sean Penn, but um, tragic event in San Francisco and just tragic in ge event in general. But Bob followed his defining creative protocol and incorporated everything. He talked with the widow, he talked with friends, family, everybody, but it took him a long time to make, but he incorporated everything, including references to the defense that uh, the, the the murderer got off by claiming that he was crazy from too much sugar. It was called the Twinkie defense. And he also commemorated, you know, the number of bullet holes and all kinds of things that were really, a lot of people thought, too dark. So locally, Many were not impressed, but nationally, internationally, Bob became a household name from this. And uh, so the Moscone bus for Bob was kind of a, a, a you know, really turning point in which he launched into the international world of art. And uh, what this did for him was it gave voice to his broader concerns, which he'd already been working on, and which were mostly a huge body of work that, about the danger of militarization, um, just a zillion works and nuclear destruction. He was concerned about that, not only through militarization, but just nuclear energy. And uh, this, for example, is called a, uh, the warhead, and it has on it all the all the effects on human bodies of whoop, I'm doing it again, uh, of uh, nuclear fallout, etc. Um, so his work was not necessarily as beautiful. It was sometimes very confrontational. But Bob's last works um, were about his pending death, which he saw coming for over a decade. Um, they record his prolonged, unnerving, disorienting, and ultimately her heroic, I think, from all accounts, um, bout with cancer. And he, a lot of this is about the, the, his own dissolving body, right? And Bob's last piece, the ashes from his body at his request from his assistant, were added to the glaze that completed his final self-portrait, which is here. I had a chance to see it um, in San Francisco when I first got to town. And when a woman was there telling about it very carefully and with tears in her eyes, and I, I snuck up and listened. And um, it was very interesting. And later... We learned that it was his uh, widow, uh, Sandy Shannon House, who still lives in Benicia in the house that they have. Anyways, um, Bob has left the house. Goodbye, Bob. But uh, Bob has left an incredible legacy, um, which we'll talk about next time. I would like to talk to you about all the people that have been influenced by Bob and the artwork that has come because of it. Anyways... That's enough about Bob. Uh, we'll certainly talk more about him, and you will be making pieces that riff off of his ideas of self-portraits and or portraits of other people. Okay, bye for now.